Honestly, I wanted to be an architect. Um, in high school, I took uh, mechanical drawing from Bruce Clark, Southwestern, and um, really loved the idea of, I wanted to design mansions, basically, you know, big houses. And um, started out at UB um, in that kind of pre-architecture program and ran into the math. And uh, math was never my strong suit. So um, switched over to political science and that was that. In your family, was there lawyers? Uh, was that part of uh, anything of your background? Well, um, my dad's, I'm gonna think cousin, uh, was Judge Barger, who um, at one point, and Alan I, Barger. yeah, Alan Barger, and I think at one point he was the longest serving Jamestown City Court judge. Judge Lamancuso may now be, but uh, yeah, Judge Barger was there for lots of years. In fact, my dad used to say he didn't get into trouble as a kid because you could hear Judge Barger in the old city hall, and I guess the courtroom was on the second floor, on Monday morning yelling at the drunks. And uh, you could hear him all the way out in the street. He's <laughs> so I guess he was a bit of a, um, uh, you know, a, a guy with a, a strong personality, put it that way. Was that any of interest to your dad, Jack? No, I don't think so. Um, he never expressed any kind of, of interest. He got started in high school, actually, um, in the uh, dry cleaning business, working for a guy by the name of Wally Olstrom. And he and Wally eventually became partners in park cleaners. So um, after high school, my dad went for a short time to what was the, I think, precursor of JCC, and I can't remember exactly what it was called. Um, it was Alfred, I think Alfred. Alfred Extension, exactly. And then, uh, and then he spent time at the uh, National Dry Cleaning Institute in Washington, uh, did a stint there, and then came back and got into the business fully with, with he and Wally. So down on 2nd Street and Park uh, Pearl uh, Laundry down in the square. No longer there anymore. But that was in the early 50s. Now there's a connect here between your family and Robert Jackson. Yes, and I think you interviewed my dad. I did, it's on YouTube for those yeah, listening. That um, uh, my father, we called him Uncle Crawford, uh, Crawford Barger, um, and Bob Jackson owned the riding stables mm -hmm. together uh, over what corner of Fairmount and Winch and all the way up to Hunt Road. Mm -hmm. And uh, at some point, apparently, Uncle Crawford, who looked out for my dad because my father's father died when my dad was uh, nine years old. Mm -hmm. And so Uncle Crawford kind of took him under his wing and uh, took him up there for riding lessons and Bob Jackson gave him riding lessons. Yeah. I didn't know that until I saw it on your video <laughs> on, on YouTube. I, I'd never heard that story from my dad. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Obviously, I, I learned about it and dad may have just mentioned it one time in passing and I said, that's good enough to get it for the camera. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> and what did you want to do for a living? She, uh, when they got married, she worked for Art Metal. Uh, she grew up in Busti, kind of a farm girl. Um, she worked for my dad a little bit, but pretty much she raised three boys. Yeah. Um, and I think at times there was a little bit of a handful. I distinctly remember, again, things you can't do today probably. She would tell us in the summer, get out of my house, I'm cleaning, cleaning, and if somebody complained and whined about, you know, oh, we're thirsty and that, she'd say, drink out of the hose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was uh, Wilhelmina Toots was her nickname. <laughs> Willie, her old friends would call her Willie, but she was, she was tough. <laughs> I remember all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> 9, 9 a.m. being tossed out in the Allen Park and saying, we'll see you at 5. Yeah, exactly. Here's a bag lunch. Enjoy it. You figure out where you're going to eat it. And you know, you think about that, they had no idea where we were, you know, for the most, and in Lakewood, 
the beauty of growing up in Lakewood um, was sidewalks. Because if you had a bike, you could go anywhere. And they had no idea. You came in for lunch, maybe, and then, you know, didn't see you again until dinner, and then you were out playing kick the can or whatever. And when it got dark, they're yelling at the back step, time to get in here. I mean, what a great childhood. Yeah, good, real good. Uh, so you Southwestern guy? Southwestern guy, 1977. 1977, and then where? Um, well, you asked before about the whole lawyer thing. When I was in high school, uh, Harry Roby was the uh, debate coach and teacher there. And so I was in debate club. They even had something called, um, if you remember this, uh, I don't think it was a club, but you participated in these extemporaneous speech competitions, mm -hmm. you know, where you, you got a topic and you got like 15 or 20 minutes to prepare and then you had to give a speech. So I did all that. And so I, I kind of liked the debating. Um, but from there, I had sort of an interesting path. Um, first semester college went to UB. Again, I wanted to get in, or I was in the pre-architecture program. Found how much math there was gonna be, kind of got disenchanted with it and being in Buffalo. So I came back to uh, JCC for my second semester freshman year lived back at home. And I took a course from a guy by the name of Charles Edward Fagan in criminal law. Really? Mr. Fagan at that point was the public defender. And after class one night, he said to me, you seem to have a real interest in this. How would you like to intern in the public defender's office? And I said, I'd love that. And I found out, however, that interning in the public defender's office meant you worked in Ed's private law office in the Westbridge building. <laughs> So uh, late into that spring, he and Lanny Sheffield, whose attorney uh, office was in the hotel, um, no, or was he with Jeff Weesey at that point? I don't remember. But anyhow, they got together and rented bigger space in the Westbridge building, and they said, why don't you stay and work with us this summer? So I did. And um, uh, that's when they also hired Phil Calla, uh, they hired um, Paul, I, Paul, Paul Andrews, I think, was there, um, and um, uh, Dave Stapleton was really? there. Yeah, well, they, they were all associates. Um, and so I worked there that summer, and then um, I went to uh, SUNY Binghamton. Um, they had a law and society program, which was joint philosophy poli-sci. And I was interested in that. And um, at that time, I don't know if this is true anymore, but at that time, Binghamton graduated more people that went to professional school than any other public university in the country. It's the old Harper College there. So I went there, I got a work-study job because I needed money for a professor and in the poli-sci department and that basically was arranging his books and doing, I mean it was you know kind of a nothing job. But in the spring, and I can't remember exactly how this happened, whether I saw a job posting, because uh, I was looking for something to do for the summer and I didn't really want to come back to Jamestown at that time. And a firm in Endicott, New York by the name of uh, Collison and Place was looking for somebody to work for them for the summer um, and they had a clerk basically who was going to go to law school and had been there and was leaving and so they needed somebody so I applied and of course I had some experience and they hired me and um, basically what the job consisted of initially was they represented the Bank of New York Southern Tier and they needed somebody to take mortgage papers uh, from their office to the Broome County Clerk's Office and file them. And that eventually evolved into actually doing the final uh, title bring downs because most lawyers in Broome County didn't use title companies for that. They had in-house people. So I learned to do that. So I learned to search title. Um, and then eventually I learned to examine title. I'd look at the searches 
for the lawyers. And this job evolved into part-time during the school year and all the school holidays. And I had that job uh, until I graduated in uh, 1981. And uh, they eventually they merged with another office. Uh, uh, Bob Thomas, uh, who was just a, he was red-haired Irishman, always wore a bow tie, president of I don't know how many cemetery associations, had estate work. He couldn't, you know, he's just the greatest guy. They were all uh, wonderful. Um, they wanted me, when they knew I was then going to go to law school, they wanted me to come back after. And, you know, I decided not to do that. But So that was college. So if I wasn't at the school, I was in their office working. And um, so after that, came back to Jamestown for that summer. And I had applied to a um, number of law schools. I got waste, wait listed at Cornell. Uh, got accepted by the University of Texas at Austin, which at that time they were trying to buy faculty, like from Yale and Harvard, because they wanted to really up their rankings. Thought seriously about going there, but got accepted at UB, so that's where I you know, decided to go. And then the summer between college and law school, I worked for Greg Yaw and Brian York at Yaw and York. Wow. <laughs> which over in uh, the furniture building, yeah. you know, uh, that was an interesting summer. <laughs> How so? Uh, they were two different people. Um, you know, uh, I did a lot of different things. I mean, Greg had all that real estate and that would have been the era when there was a ton of oil and gas work mm -hmm. too going on. So I got involved in some of that and Brian was doing a lot of matrimonial at that point, I think. So they were they were two, you know, very di different people, but that was it was a good summer. Then I went off to law school. That's when the fun really began. Unbeknownst to me, and I've done quite a bit of um, studying about what law school is all about and the classes, and uh, I had taken a lot of pre-law stuff. Uh, in fact, I had a professor in college um, who was the head of this. Uh, uh, law and society uh, major who I became a teaching assistant for in my senior year and he took me aside one day and he said you know you're really good at this teaching stuff I, I want you to go to graduate school and you could come back and teach at the university level and I said no 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 I want to go to law school <laughs> there's some days I wonder if I shouldn't have done that um, and I'll tell you why in, in, a, in a minute. But in any event, so I had done quite a bit of studying about law school, and I pretty much knew, you know, what all the first-year courses were. Constitutional law, you know, property, contracts, torts, right? So I get to UB, and UB had hired a new dean by the name of Thomas Hedrick, who came from Berkeley. And Dean Hedrick decided that of the three sections, right, law schools typically you divide your first year class into three sections, of the three sections one of those was going to be an experimental section. Guess who got put in the experimental section? <laughs> and they did some very interesting things. For example, um, the contracts teacher and the torts teacher decided to combine their class and call it contorts. I think every student in that section, including me, was baffled by the end of that semester as to anything to identify what was a contract versus what was a tort. <laughs> and it was just bizarre. And um, I really, it was not, you know, anything that I thought it was going to be. And so I decided after the first semester that maybe this isn't for me. And um, came home. Uh, you know, needed something to do, so somehow, for some reason, um, Norm Herbie took me under his wing and said, you know, you, maybe you should try insurance. And after a few weeks of trying to sell policies to my friends and family, uh, I said, no, I don't think I want to do that. And somehow, 
discovered, I'm sure I was talking to them, that um, Fagan and Sheffield was looking for somebody. And uh, they had a clerk by the name of Billy Davis who um, helped out with the real estate and the billing and this and that. And Billy was leaving to, he actually ended up being a nurse. Uh, actually did his estate. Um, so I went back to being a clerk for them and uh, they ended up terminating their partnership. And um, that's when I... Was that, was that acrimonious? Well, <laughs> I'm not asking you to belie your I, 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 two, again, two, you know, law partners, like a marriage, right? You know, opposites. Um, Ed was very involved in some of his side businesses, um, and Lanny had really no interest in that. And it, it you know, I and I, I don't really know the ins and outs, but. It, um, you know, it resulted that they, they had a, a brief, and I mean brief, like it might have been a couple weeks, partnership with Fred Larson, too, <laughs> during that. And I think Fred kind of got in there and saw that there was some, you know, unhappiness between the two of them, and uh, it lasted about two weeks. So. <laughs> you touched a lot of people. Oh, believe me, uh, you know. So, um, I, d I decided that what I was uh, going to do um, was I was going to go back to law school. And I reapplied to UB and got in, was put in the traditional section this time, and actually did very well. But I also decided, and I had worked this out because I, I started working for Chuck Hall at that point when Ed and Lanny uh, split up. And I told them that I wanted to try the clerkship route. And of course, you have to have an attorney sponsor for that. And that's what Lanny had done, but Lanny never went to law school. Lanny did it when you could clerk for four years. Mm -hmm. and he did it for Jeff, with Jeff Weesey, under Jeff Weesey. And, and Chuck was okay with that. And so um, I went, still working some for Chuck, um, and I commuted to law school from Jamestown. I'm not ashamed to say that many a day I was reading a case book on my knees as I'm driving up the thruway. And in all the crappy winter weather and that, I, you know, things you do as a kid, you look back and say, I must have been crazy. But I, I finished the first year. Um, Buffalo had this weird grading system too. They, you either got an H or a G or a P or an F or something like that. And I, I had pretty much all H's in my classes. But again, it was all traditional contracts and torts and you know all that stuff. So um, came back, worked for Chuck full time, did the three year clerkship. And um, then it came time to uh, take the bar. And because of the timing, I had to take the February bar. And so um, obviously wanted to take a review course and uh, the two popular ones at that time were Peepers and Barbrai. And Jay Gardner Peeper was a kind of a cult figure with the bar exam at that point because his approach was, even though he had some books, a two volume series actually, bound, he basically said, don't even worry about the books. That's for your reference once you're an attorney. Quick reference. You sat in a classroom at the UB Law School and you, and I'm not kidding, you literally wrote down every word he said. 1,200 pages of notes, which I condensed down to 200 and that's what I studied from and pretty much memorized for the bar exam. Yeah, yeah and passed it, and the pass rate was like 43% in February. But the funny story is, <laughs> Ned Barone was taking the bar exam in February too, and I think that was his second try, or third. I mean, it took Ned a few tries to do it. He had a family and, you know, so he had other distractions. 
but we decided we were gonna get an apartment together. And, you know, he'd be there during the week, he'd go home on the weekends, and I did sometimes too, but... So we rented this apartment from a guy who was a client of Chuck Hall's, who I ended up representing by the name of Robert Klein. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. So we rent this apartment, and the first, the night before the first day of class, and the first day of class was a Saturday, because they went Saturdays too, for six weeks or seven weeks. And I get there, Ned gets there, and we had two blow up mattresses. That was it. So Ned's bright idea was, let's go out. Well, I didn't know at the time that Ned had gone to college in Buffalo. Mm. And he knew every bar and every bartender on the Elmwood Strip. We got home about four. <laughs> had to be in class at eight or so the next morning. Made it to class. About halfway through, I turned to him and I said, Barone, if we don't rent some furniture and a TV, we're going to die. <laughs> and he said, okay. So we rented a couch and a table and a TV because we were... <laughs> and, you know, we... Uh, and I, he, he didn't pass that, that time, and, and I did. I remember walking out of the exam um, and saying, I didn't pass that. Didn't come close, you know. And... Uh, so, and then, you know, once, uh, once that happened, then I, I went into partnership with Chuck, and um, that would have been in, what, 1987, and we were partners until 1991, and then I left, kind of wanted to open my, have my own practice, and um, rented Howard Crosley's old office in the Fenton Building, okay. incorporated Mark L. Barger PC, I uh, had a brief stint where I was going to go in with Jimmy Subject and Ned and um, Bill Benka. Um, decided, didn't really want to do that, or maybe they decided, I don't remember which, but um, started doing a lot of mortgage work for Mark Nelson, the infamous Mark Nelson. and. Um, uh, hired an assistant and was chugging along with that and um, uh, somehow must have run into Lanny somewhere. And in the meantime, Lanny Sheffield and Lauren Bly had, and Paul Andrews had formed a partnership in 1987 and bought the building at Three Lakeview. And Paul lasted about a year and then went to the DA's office. Uh, real estate drove him out because every deal he had turned into a lawsuit. <laughs> and um, so I got to talking with Lanny and, you know, we uh, worked out a deal where I came over there. And then maybe, what? Well, Ned was over there for a while. That didn't last. Um, and Pete Pelletieri came maybe five years later, five or six mm -hmm. years later. And we hired him as an associate, and then after a couple of years, he became a partner. And um, Jamie McCallum was there for a few years. Uh, Paul Andrews come back and worked for us as a clerk after he retired from Mayville to help with some estate stuff. Uh, at one point in that building, everybody, it's for sale now. Uh, and everybody asked us, well, why are you selling this? And I said, well, we used to have 15 people here, you know, um, and there's four now, and there'll, there'll be three. So, uh, but yeah, I, I came over there in uh, 1992. Wow. So I've been there 30 years. Been at this a long time. Uh, yeah, if you add it all up to back to 1978, that's a lot of years. And principally, all of that's private practice. You were never in the public. No. At one point, I got asked to be assistant corporation counsel. Somebody took me aside, and I can't remember who it was, and said, you don't really want to do that. It's too political over there, and you're not a political person. 
and so I turned it down. I can't remember who asked me to do it. I was with when I was with Chuck. Yeah. So other than that, private practice in a, in a now in a time when there aren't that many private practitioners. It's amazing, you know. I I tell people when I started practicing, and you, you can relate to this, you know, probably almost better than anybody. There was so much good commercial work for lawyers in Jamestown. There was what, two locally in owned insurance companies, all the banks were locally owned, all the private industry. I mean, I spent um, years ago a fair amount of time doing collections work for Hope's Windows all over the country, which was fun because basically what it involved is they had a, a matter that had gone bad in Hawaii. So I be hiring lawyers out in Hawaii to, to take care of it and it was kind of fun but I mean you think of the law firms back then mm -hmm. and how many people and you know everybody represented a bank you know and they had all that that good commercial work that came with it and pretty much it's gone away it's a it's a totally different practice than it was 30 years ago so you've limited your practice well, I say limited but uh, to, I don't think you've done too much criminal work, did you? Very little. You know, I didn't, I never really liked night court. I liked seeing the other lawyers, but I didn't, I had a young family and I really didn't like being out at night. And in fact, I used to tell the story that um, we lived in Bemis for a number of years. So of course I knew the judges and, and I said, I'd walk into the Ellery Justice Court and the clerk would look at me and Randy President or whoever the judge would look at me and they'd say, are you lost? This isn't the county clerk's office, Mark. And I would say, I know one thing. I know I need to get here ahead of Cala. Because <laughs> Phil would come with his big thing, a public defender, and if you got behind him, you were there for hours. <laughs> I knew I showed up ahead of Cala. <laughs> for the longest time in Ellery, it was uh, Judge President and uh, Wallace, wasn't it? Yes, Larry Wallace. Yeah, and they would repair to the Caesar house after court, yeah, of course. you know, and uh, so, but, um, so I never did that. I, um, uh, I did a variety of things. You know, it's hard. In a small town, you pretty much, young lawyer, you know, you pretty much take everything. I did some matrimonial. I did some family court. Um, not a ton of it. Um, mostly real estate, uh, residential and commercial. I've always represented lenders. You know, um, and um, <laughs> when John Young, famous from Young Title, would have some naughty title problem, he'd call me up and he'd say, I'm going to send something to you. <laughs> or worse, I'd be dropping off something and he'd say, hey, come in the back room for a few minutes <laughs> and I'd be there for hours. But um, I always say that I, I had two claim to fames publicly. One was the... Um, kill the, the mall uh, matter where uh, this company wanted to build something called the Gallery of Chautauqua Mall up on Strunk Road right next to Dr. Services at property and uh, um, oh why am I drawing a blank um, the farm store there Peterson. Peterson's Alan Peterson's and they were clients of Chuck Hall's. And of course, you know, I got the job of uh, doing something about this. And so we, we formed a not-for-profit group. We had meetings at the Fluvanna Fire Hall. In fact, uh, there's a newspaper clipping, my mother kept all this, of me talking to a group of about 120 people at the Fluvanna Fire Hall, all in opposition, you know, uh, to the mall. And for good or for bad, you know, they, ended up not building. And uh, then the other one was um, I started representing um, the uh, then manager of the Holiday Inn, the former Holiday Inn, did, did her real estate deal. And there was a company that was running that and she had been brought in from somewhere in the south and so she started calling me on various issues and did a fair amount of work for them. And then they moved her and they brought in a guy by the name of Tom Haygreen, 
uh, famous for the, I started calling it the hay green step because before he'd hit a golf ball, he'd always step behind it to depress the turf a little bit. Really? <laughs> so I, I coined it the, the hay green step. And Tom and I became pretty good friends and so continued to do work for that company. Well, that was in his tenure when the city decided they were going to close the parking ramp, which of course was the main parking source and connected to the hotel. So, you know, I spent quite a bit of time doing the dog and pony show in front of the city council and there's newspaper articles about that showing me, you know, talking to them and, you know, all kinds of, you know, threats and this and that if, you know, they didn't provide some uh, alternatives and they ended up with a shuttle system but it was kind of interesting because before they built this hotel right across the street here uh, there was talk about building the parking ramp there and then connecting it through a series of above ground elevated walkways to the ice arena and whatever future development which the comedy center wasn't you know, even a twinkle maybe in somebody's eyes, but there was, and to the hotel. That was going to be the benefit to the hotel is that they were going to connect that. Yeah. Um, and of course it, it didn't happen and they rebuilt the parking ramp. But um, um, one other funny story. So um, I learned that um, Holiday Inn for its higher level employees, management employees, um, had these passes and they essentially allowed you to stay at any Holiday Inn for 10 bucks a night. So Hay Green got me some of those and we uh, stayed a week in Hilton Head at the Holiday Inn. When I checked in, the person on, at the desk looked at me and looked at those passes and it's like, who is this guy? So I managed somehow to the manager to slip in um, in a conversation down there that I was with the legal department at Holiday Inn. Mm. Next thing I knew, there's a bowl of fruit in the room, <laughs> there's champagne. <laughs> They're like, what is this guy doing here? You know, and so I'd, I'd go out in the hall and I'd look around. I wanted a clipboard, you know, yeah, just yeah, a <laughs> <laughs> But uh, Tom eventually Took another job somewhere. I was sorry to see him go, and then of course, you know, not a Holiday Inn anymore. But uh, so I spent quite a bit of time doing that, and uh, just uh, you know, a lot of business stuff, a lot of real estate. Um, never once, you know, sat around and wondered what to do. You know, we we had uh, two female associates, uh, Lana Houston, who's now the chief deputy uh, clerk at the surrogates court and um, Ashley Smith, who's the Cattaraugus County attorney. Um, and they used to say to me, how do you do it? The phone rings all day and all, you get these contracts and all this, how do you do it? And you try to say, well, you know, I mean, you gotta be out in the community. I belong to the AM Rotary, you know, I've always been a longtime member of the Bemis Methodist Church, you know, other organizations, community foundation. You get your 30 second elevator speech, you know, you hand out cards, uh, you know, uh, being in the courts of course helps because people know you and I said, you know, after seven, eight, nine years, it just kind of happens. All of a sudden the floodgates open up sure. and they were just mystified as to, as to that. Um, it's a minor thing, you're humble, you're being humble here is you provide very good service. Well, you know, to tell you the truth, I'm finding out from some of my long-term clients, and you mentioned you know, how few attorneys there are now that, that are in private practice and want to deal with um, an office and being the HR guy and payroll and just paying the bills and dealing with all the administrative stuff. Um, I've had some long-term clients who, and I've referred to other attorneys who have called me and said, well, they don't return my calls or, you know, you, you would, you know, call me the same day or while you're driving home or at night or, you know, and so I always tried to be really responsive to, to the clients and, and I've said this to many people and I think it's true that 
80% of my clients became my friends. Sure. So, um, and that made doing the work, you know, enjoyable. Um, had folks in the office this morning who I've known for 30 years. My wife used to babysit their kids and we were part of this group in Bemis that hung out every Friday night and, and used to go to the Hare and Hounds upstairs because our friend Randy Graham would be playing guitar. Occasionally we would join in singing. <laughs> How's your voice? Uh, it's not bad. Yeah, sang in the choir for a number of years. so uh, Not as good as my wife's. Okay. <laughs> Plus she can read music and I have no idea about that. <laughs> I'm going to show you a 1987 Jamestown Bar Association composite. I'm going to bring it over to you. Uh, yes, we've got this in our office. Yeah. Jim Abdella. Uh, I like Jim, and his office was in the hotel when I was, was there. Um, By the way, it's a 1987 composite. Yeah. And I think it's got to be one of your early year pictures. It, first year. Yeah. First year, yeah. My young. Uh, Jim was, was always very, very kind to me. We'd have real estate deals together, and I'd go down uh, with an issue or a problem, and he would he would just drop whatever he was doing and sit down and go through it with me. He was just so nice to a young attorney. Uh, I remember that. Um, <laughs> Chuck D'Angelo, he and I uh, had an Article 78 case together, if you can believe that, mm. that we litigated, and um, I won. And Chuck appealed it. This is the one and only time I went to the appellate division and won. <laughs> Tom Dory, uh, Tom and I became uh, good friends, um, particularly when he was bankruptcy trustee. He, if he ended up with a piece of property uh, in a bankruptcy, he would hire me as his attorney to sell it. Ah. So, and uh, invaluable because I, did quite a bit of bankruptcy work at one time and if I had an issue that I just wasn't sure how it was going to be handled, I could just call him and, and say, what are you going to do with this? I mean, that was absolutely invaluable. Amen. Um, and Lanny at the time, Lanny Shepard did a lot of bankruptcy. Lanny did a lot of bankruptcy, sure. Yeah, that and, was sort of your Right, and, and uh, the prior trustee, of course, was Doug Spoto. Oh, I forgot that. Right. Oh, man. <laughs> Night and day difference there. Phil Erickson. In our office, we used to laugh about the Phil Erickson rule, because if you had a, uh, an issue on a real estate deal and you differed with Phil and you called him up and said, Phil, I, I don't agree with you on this, he would say, oh, that's the way it's going to be. And what the answer was, because I'm Phil Erickson, that's why. <laughs> and that was that. I mean, there's just no argument with Phil. <laughs> Warren Erickson, again, uh, over at the hotel. I had a number of dealings with Warren, and of course Stan Weeks was his partner. And um, Warren was very kind to me too, and you know would go through things with me. Um, <laughs> oh boy, Mike Foley had some things with Mike when he was was here. Is he still practicing? No, no, he's in New York City doing uh, museum work. Really? Yeah. Gosh. Um, Al Ford. Again, in the hotel, you'd go to Al's office and there was just a blue cloud of smoke between him and Connie. And they, what bank did they represent? They did all the work for one of the mortgage lenders. Might have been Sibley before actually Lauren got that, Lauren and Terry. But you'd walk in there and that's when Randy Reinhardt was there. And it was just a blue cloud. Of smoke. <laughs> and Mike Goldman. Mike and I had a lot of stuff together over the years. Um, again, always was so kind to me. He, I'd be sitting in city court, Mike would walk in and he'd look at me he's like, Mark, what are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> and of course Chuck Hall, you know, like I said, we, we spent uh, a lot of years together and uh, thing about Chuck could never keep up with him work-wise he'd get in the office at 8 he'd leave at 5 he'd be back by 7 30 or 8 o'clock at night work till 11 where he would go to the photocopier take all of his letters that day copy them 
fold them, put them in the envelope, stamp them, and make it to the post office before they close their back door and mail them. Go home, 11.30 at night, be back the next day, 8 o'clock, Saturdays, Sundays. You couldn't outwork Chuck. Okay. I mean, his, you remember his secretary, Madeline Olson. I can still remember her with the three ring checkbook with a pencil balancing the trust account be off by a penny. Oh, no, no, no. Chuck would have a client come in in the afternoon, and sometimes for large things, agreements, contracts, he would dictate it that night perfectly. Madeline would type it the next day, and the client would be signing it that afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, gosh, Mark Hampton, you know, he was not the easiest guy to deal with. He, he isn't, he, he, Mark's way was the way you did it. <laughs> I'll just say it like that. Oh, well, Marty Idzik. I mean, find a nicer guy. You know, I'd come to your office uh, to drop off real estate documents and to talk to Janet and Annette and just kind of, and, you know, Marty would see me and he'd always come up and want to talk and find out how everything was. And what a nice guy. Um, well, of course, John Lamacuso, you know. <laughs> uh, I think I benefited over the years. He and my partner are pretty close. They're golf partners. Yeah, yeah. So I'd show up in city court, and I wasn't there that often, but he'd look up and he'd say, Mr. Barker, what can I do for you today? <laughs> uh, Joe Girassi. Of course, Joe's related to Marie Sheffield because she's an Alimo, and that's the same. But I took over and, and did a handful of tax assessment cases, which used to be Tykes, you know, big, big thing, and helped them with some. Lauren Bly. Lauren Bly, right, Tyke, yeah. And so I figured out they weren't that difficult to do. And Judge Jirasi was the one who was exclusively hearing those. That's right. And um, I had one um, where my client was um, the uh, owners of uh, the uh, mobile home park on um, Dutch Hollow Road, mm -hmm. High Acres. And Neil Robinson represented the town of Ellery. So um, I file my papers, and we have the first of many conferences with the judge. And um, uh, he finally says, well, you know, I, I, I think you should both get preliminary appraisals. Fine. So I uh, had Pete Holt from uh, Holt Appraisals do mine. And Neil uh, went to Gar Associates from Buffalo. Um, Gar had uh, done um, the town's reval town of Ellery's reval a few years before. <laughs> what Neil didn't know is that Gar has several divisions. They have the reval division and then they have the individual division. So I get Neil's appraisal. It's less than mine. <laughs> it's less than what they uh, valued it when they did the reval. Oh so the next time we get in front of Judge Durasi, the judge says, well, gentlemen, do you have your appraisals? And I said, yes, Judge, and I'm taking Neil's. <laughs> and Neil didn't know what to say. And we ended up settling it, but <laughs> I actually tried, an, which I never probably should have done, but I tried an appraisal case in front of Judge Gerasi for Jim Page on his house on Lakeside Drive in Bemis. And his main argument was there was a electric lines that went through his front yard and a sewer uh, grinder pump. And that devalued the property dramatically. That was a tough sell. <laughs> Kenny Lasker, he and I were in Rotary together and uh, had a few things together. Not, not too many, but good friend. Uh, Lucian, you and I already talked about him. Oh my gosh. I mean, <laughs> just to hear him on the phone and, oh, gosh, he and Doug together. Oh, yeah, Franklin. I mean, Lashandros. I mean, we used to joke in the office, could you imagine if Lucian was the judge and Doug was his clerk? <laughs> you imagine? 
Ay, ay, ay. I lived across the street from Don Lynn in Jamestown um, when he was corporation counsel, I think. Nice guy. Never really had much with him, but. Oh. <sighs> Rennie Purley. Again, used to go when his dad was uh, alive. Um, used to go down to their office and their secretary would be reading a dime store novel and his dad would be in his office with one estate file, probably a huge estate. And that's all they had going on. I mean, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was kind of bizarre. But Rennie, always a, a good guy, boy. He, he made every bar association picnic and every, <laughs> you know. Very consistent. Very consistent. Always played poker. I, <laughs> you may remember in the good old days, when the uh, bar picnic was at the Edelman's Club. Sure. And the young guys, their job was to go up early oh. and do the clams Damn. and get the bar set up and all that stuff. And of course, the keg got tapped. And I remember being up there with Jimmy Subject one year and those were fun parties. But, um, and of course, the sheriff was there and everything. <laughs> and you're thinking, well, if something happens on the way home, I'm gonna say, Sheriff Bentley's, I just came from him. <laughs> but the guys would, you know, play poker, and Lanny, of course, Doug, and, you know, all those guys. And that's the days when you invited everybody, the county clerk, you know, all the, the deputies in the county, you know, the, you know, in the clerk's office, the abstract, I mean, everybody. Those were fun days. Great fellowship. <laughs> Joe Ricotta. I had some cases in front of Joe Ricotta uh, over in Dunkirk, life me, I can't remember what kind of cases they were now, but I, I had some cases in front of him. Um, Judge Ricotta had a nickname that I won't repeat. <laughs> it was interesting to practice in front of him. And then of course, Bill Cass Senior, or Junior, not Senior, Junior. Um, back when I was doing matrimonials, uh, we said the same thing about Judge Cass as we do about the current Judge Cass. You tell the clients, look, I can pretty much tell you how this is gonna come out. You know, because the judge kind of has his rules and that's kind of the way it is. But you and I talked about Hope Fredrickson earlier. I tried a divorce case with Hope. Believe it or not, she had a divorce client. She had the wife, not surprisingly, and the wife worked at Cummins. I had the husband and he had a job that paid about half what the wife did. So I was arguing to the Judge Cass that my client ought to get maintenance because she made double the money. Well, Hope didn't like that at all and she actually put her client on the stand and the judge would take his customary 10 o'clock break or whatever and he said, I want to see both counsel in my chambers he left the door open and there were witnesses for this case. I mean, this was a, he left the door open. He got us in there and he slammed his fist on the table and said, Hope, your client is gonna pay maintenance. <laughs> and the case settled. <laughs> <laughs> but just, just like, you know, Steve, I mean, when I was, again, doing some matrimonial, I would tell the, look, I'm gonna, you can argue all you want. I'm gonna tell you exactly how the judge is gonna rule on this. And it might be worse for you if you make him sit through a trial. So you better settle. And that was, and, and he knew that. And Judge Cass, Steve would, you know, and he'd go through it on the record and explain, and this is why I'm doing this. And he even came into one of the little client uh, consultation rooms one time in a difficult case I had and walked in robes on and said, look, I'm just gonna tell you why I'm gonna rule this way and talk to my client. I really, I remember that. I was so yeah. touched that he would do that, you know. Um, definitely a good guy. Judge Adams, <laughs> as a young lawyer, for some reason, I guess it was a rite of passage, I was on the assigned counsel list for a short time. And I had this guy who was in the jail 
assault charge, burglary, something. I went to see him, came back for a pretrial with Judge Adams, who was in his shirt sleeves with his suspenders playing solitaire. Never looked up. Mr. Barger, yes, Judge. Did you go see your client across the street? Yes, Judge. And did you tell that little SOB he's going to plead guilty? <laughs> Never looked up. We had that conversation, Judge. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I used to do, I mean, you know, I do foreclosures and that more civil stuff in county court. I, I had very few, you know, criminal matters. Um, but again, it seems like a bygone era. You show up in county court on Monday mornings, right? With all the other lawyers and, you know. Calendar call. Yeah, calendar call. Um, man, seems like a long time ago. Judge Alessi appeared, of course, before him, you know, in city court uh, a number of times. What I most remember him was sitting at the round table at the town club. Mm -hmm. He would never pay for tea. He would ask for hot water and lemon. Never, and he, he didn't want to be charged for it. Oh, <laughs> um, and then going to their offices, you know, again, over in the Fenton building. Um, there's Willard Perley. He got on the other side here. Greg Peterson. Wow. We've had quite a bit of stuff over the years. What? Always enjoyed it. I, you know, like I said, I used to love to come down to your offices. Yeah, because of me. Well, yeah, mainly to see Annette and, and Janet and just, you know, but, I, and again, they were, and, and you were always so helpful. They were always so helpful. You know, I mean, as a young lawyer, I had, you know, and especially when I had my own practice in, in the Fenton building, you know, I mean, there was a lot of stuff I just didn't know how to do. So always appreciated it. Always appreciated it. It's been a, a joy to practice with, with people like you. And like I said, Marty. John Plum, one of the all-time nicest guys, had a few, th probably more than I remember, but things with him over the years. Gentleman is the word that comes to my mind when I think of John. Just wonderful to deal with. Uh, the prices, I was always scared of them. Because <laughs> you go into their, their office, very quiet. You could hear typing, but boy, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of, Fifth, fifth floor of the Fenton building. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know. Sammy Price. Again, one of the nicest guys that I ever knew. You know, uh, he'd call me up, you know, Sammy, Mark, hey, we got this deal. We got to do this and that, you know. Super nice to, just to deal with. Just wonderful. Um, Tom Price, who I still have quite a bit of association with again one of the nicest guys that I know helpful I just whatever you need you know uh, I'll drop something off there and you know, drop everything and you know hey I got a problem with this Tom and I don't know what to do about this and what about you know just absolutely wonderful to deal with Wilson Price or Tripp he and I had a few go rounds because Tripp he he'd get stuck on something and that would be it but he was always funny to be around, though. Oh, gosh, he was funny. <laughs> Just a, a big personality, right? No question. John Rice, Pat Rice. Um, we had a few go-arounds on things. Always friendly, but I, I had a case. Uh, poor Pat. He, up in the um, Mayville area where um, he... Um, it was an easement case, and we actually tried it. And um, my clients were these lovely old couple who had been using this access to the lake for 50 years. And um, the children of the people over whose land the easement ran, uh, the parents had died or something, and they blocked it, and they were just nasty to these old couples. So we, we tried this case in Mayville. I'm trying to remember. One of the judges that was coming down from Buffalo, and 
I had my client on the stand who was this 80 year old woman from Pittsburgh, uh, deeply religious, just after she got done testifying, the judge says, can I see both counsel in my chambers? Went in there and he looked at Pat and he said, counselor, you better settle this case because it's not gonna go well for you after that testimony. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I wish I could remember the judge's name because we would all know and not like him shouldn't say that, but he actually went out to the property because the settlement proposed that they move the easement, and he wanted to see to make sure that it was going to be, you know, the right thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Dale Robbins. What can you say about Dale? Dale and I would call each other on Saturday mornings to make sure we were both working. You yeah, know? there you go. Yeah, yeah. But, again, somebody I loved practicing with because he was just always, you know, so accommodating. Neil Robinson, same thing, you know, uh, just a great guy. John Samuelson, John and I had some stuff together, um, some matrimonials here and there, you know, uh, but got to know John more when I was with Yaw New York because their offices were right next to him, yeah. Fenton building. Tubi Scarpino, I think of that story that Ed Fagan told at uh, Tubi's memorial where he got a referral from Tubi and the client came in and, and Ed said, well, I know you've been a long time client at Tubi's. Why are you here to see me? And the client said, well, Tubi said you were the second biggest SOB in town. That's why <laughs> I remember that. Bruce Colton. Oh, I miss Bruce. He, uh, he and I, over the years, we had quite a bit of stuff together and um, farm credit things when he did that. And one of the smartest lawyers I think I ever knew. He and Lanny studied for the bar together. Did you really? Yeah. Yeah. And Lanny said he learned so much from Bruce. You know, he's, he's just brilliant. brilliant. Um, the Selstroms, of course, who I'm related to, you know, because Crawford Barger married Mae Selstrom. Ah. So the Bargers and the Selstrom. So Steve and I always call each other cousins, John's son. And uh, we've had good good dealings over the years. Um, Lanny Sheffield, my ex-partner, retired partner, um, Lanny made the practice of law fun. He didn't take it too seriously. He took it seriously, but he didn't take it seriously, if you know what I mean. Uh, the ritual was Thursday mornings, I'd get in the office and he'd see me walking by his office. He'd say, Barger, come here, come here, come here, shut the door. And Lanny used to bowl on Wednesday nights where he got a lot of matrimonial clients at the bar afterwards. <laughs> and I would hear the Wednesday night bowling jokes on Thursday morning. He used to walk around the office and if people were laughing, he'd say, you can't do that. This is a law office. This is a serious place. And then he'd tell you a dirty joke. Yeah, yeah. But Lanny uh, and Marie, who was our office manager, uh, it made the practice just delightful. You could go in and talk to him about anything. He'd open his drawer. He had a complete selection of pharmaceuticals. So the girls would go in with headaches and this and that. He'd pull up the drawer. What do you need? Yeah. <laughs> uh, made a mean Manhattan, let me tell you. In fact, when he was back here just for the summers, um, I had an estate, very long story, very short, where my client was living with his girlfriend at Chautauqua in her house. And he died suddenly. And his girlfriend was the executor. Two weeks later, she died. Mm. Guess who was the alternate executor? So when they cleaned out the girlfriend's house, her family, they brought me like four black garbage bags full of paper. And so I said to Marie, I said, who was doing all of our estate work, I said, we got to go through this. She says, well, come to the house. And this is when they had bought this little house up on Elmere in, in Falconer. And they had built a sunroom on the back of it. So we go there. And I spent the afternoon with Lanny and Marie. Marie and I going through each and every scrap of paper. And Lanny was making us Manhattans. Oh, my God. Oh, boy. <laughs> But Lanny, he, the day that they, and I remember this very well, the day that they finally packed 
and uh, they sold their house on Lakeview, and uh, they fully relocated to Vegas. It was like losing your dad yeah, yeah. when they pulled out of the driveway. Yeah, yeah. I, I got very emotional, and I every time I still do this. You know, now I've got a limited number of times to do it, but I'm typically in the office Saturday mornings. And every time I walk in that building, I always say, Sheffield, this is all your fault. <laughs> I told him that. Uh, but he just, I just love Lanny. Richard Slater, I had a few things with him, not, not much. Um, he bought my parents' house in Lakewood when they moved around the corner. So uh, Dick Sotier had a few things with him. Again, mostly matrimonial stuff. Some of it wasn't happy, but you know, we always ended on good terms. Doug Spoto, oh my gosh, of course, his office was in the hotel and you could get within maybe a hundred feet of it and hear Doug screaming and cursing and oh gosh, and he'd call you up and it was always, this is what we're gonna do as if he were the client, right? You know, we're not doing this in that deal. What do you mean we? <laughs> You know, and he would just, as a young lawyer, I mean, he just ran over you, right? You know, it's like, this is what you're going to do, Mark. Yeah, oh, yeah. But now he likes to tell stories. Doug is mellowed. Uh, Dave Stapleton. <laughs> Dave was, I, again, you know, good guy. He, he looks exactly like this. He's never changed. Um, used to, he used to do a lot of bank work, so we would run across each other. Um, Jimmy Subject. You know, Jimmy, always a good relationship. We had we had a few things, especially after, it seemed like when he moved his office to Fredonia, mm -hmm. and I had, of course, my one day a week Westfield office, we had more stuff together. Um, Bev Unger, of course, you know, um, I had I had some, some things with Bev. Not much, but a wonderful person. Bob Van Every, we used to talk about uh, you know, Bob would, would call you up and say, well, I think this about this matter because I was reading the advance sheets last night. <laughs> Bob, really? <laughs> so very particular, very good attorney, very good attorney, very particular about things. Um, <laughs> Bob and I used to talk about, all we talk about, all kind, just, we just get off on all these tangents. So Paul Webb, Miss Paul, I, again, never had a lot of stuff with him, but again, a very bright guy, very bright guy. Stan Weeks, we talked about him a little, really didn't have much with Stan. I mean, more, I had more contact with Stan once I was kind of involved with the Community Foundation. Ward Westerberg, chain smoker. That's what I be talking to, just chain smoking. Jim Westman, had more stuff with Jim in the early years when I was doing some collection stuff and, and some matrimonial. Um, feisty, if you wanted a feisty lawyer, you hired Jim, right? Um, I never had a lot of dealings with the rights. I mean, the younger rights, obviously, you know, um, the current ones. Um, Steve and I, Steve and I were on the Community Foundation field, then it was called the Field of Interest Grants Committee together, and we were the naysayers, Steve especially. And we got to be known as, here's the guys, if, if, they're, if you're gonna get a no vote in the committee for something, it's gonna be these guys. And we developed the egg salad rule. And that rule was, we're not funding egg salad. So we wouldn't fund parties, balloons, t-shirts, and it, it, it's a joke over there. If you ask anybody over there, ask Tori, what's the egg salad rule? She'll say, oh my gosh, that's Mark Barger and Steve Wright. And, you know, we'd, we'd be looking at some of these grant requests and Steve would just roll his eyes and grow. <laughs> <laughs> when we talk now, we have a few things together. In fact, he's representing the buyers of, of our condo that we're selling. You know, we always talk about the Community Foundation days, which that committee that I just had my last meeting for, and I got blindsided because we had the meeting at Greg Jones's condo in Bemis. Well, I got there, the last person, and I walked in and they said, oh, here's the guest of honor. And I went, uh-oh. And there were some tears and hugs and everything. Oh, and they said, do you know how long you've been on this committee? 
said, not really. And it's like 13 years. The most fun I've ever had on any board, committee, because of the people, Randy Sweeney, of course, initially, and then now Tori, but just all the people. I mean, it's, I'm going to miss that. And that was my last meeting, so. But yeah, Steve Wright, he's, <laughs> we, we just usually get on the phone and complain about things. <laughs> and then, of course, Greg and, and Brian, you know. Um, Greg Yaw, I think, I think he was the best attorney in the county. I mean, uh, you know, he just was, and he was, he did real estate by the hour and he got paid. <laughs> and, you know, the rest of us, you know, we're following Doug Spoto, you know, yeah, I'll do that deal for 250. <laughs> you know, Doug, come on. <laughs> but Greg, you know, um, and he had those kind of clients, the, the, the timber companies, the oil and gas companies, and they just would pay him to do that. And I, I always remember, Greg, he'd have his cross pencil and pen, never without it, you know, very organized, very, yeah, just, you know, hard worker, just, and he was, he was just, everything he did was just precise. That would be the word I would, say for him was just absolutely precise. So Ned Barone must have not made the picture. Like I said, Ned, Ned and I are old buddies. Um, but just thinking about those days studying for the bar exam, I mean, he used to, he used to laugh at me because um, going over notes and that at night, every night, I'd always have a beer or two and he'd say, I don't know how you, I said, Ned, it helps me really. If, if I didn't, you know, I'd be climbing the walls, you know, at this point. He used to laugh at that, but that is such a, he's fun to be around. In fact, Terry in our office, Terry Toter, who may be the longest legal assistant in the city right now, has forgotten more about real estate than you and I ever will know. She still talks about, she loved having Ned in the office yeah. because he was just, just fun to be around. You know, just a kind of a rolling party, but I'm sure there's others that I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm missing here, but. Um, so as you're looking in the camera and you are at the uh, end of a almost 40 year career here. Yeah. Uh, do you have any advice you would give to a fledgling lawyer who's coming into Chautauqua County? I've actually had the occasion to do that recently. Um, and my advice um, was you have, to, you have to be a member of the community. You've got to be involved. You know, whether it's a service club, uh, church, uh, community foundations, get on boards, get to know people, um, pay attention to what your clients are saying, listen to them, be a good listener, don't, and, and don't just spout legalese back at them. Just to sort of close that loop, I said that I had a professor in college that wanted me to to go to graduate school, and, and I was a teaching assistant for him. A number of years ago, Greg Rabb called me up and said, they've appointed me to this big administrative position. It's a kind of a short-term thing. Would you be able to teach my business law class? Okay, so I did. So I, and the, it was at the Warren Extension Campus. He didn't tell me that at first. I ended up teaching at JCC, but it was, so in the middle of the winter, I'm driving a Warren every Wednesday night, and, uh, but I loved it. I loved the teaching part of it. And I actually had a student, uh, and they were all adults, it was a night. I had a student who, um, super nice guy, ran a tire shop in Warren, and he got to class early one night, comes in with a cup of coffee, and he says, well, Mr. Barger, you finally got me, you got me. He's older than I am. He's calling me Mr. Barger. So what do you mean? He said, well, I, I was out getting coffee, 
And as I'm coming out of the coffee shop, there's an accident right in front of the... And he said, now in the old days, I would I wonder if anybody's hurt or... He said, oh, no, no, I'm thinking, hmm, negligence. And he starts spouting all this stuff. He says, you got me. And I said, yes, you're thinking like a lawyer. <laughs> but I, I, in, I enjoyed the teaching. And, I, and then Greg, of course, one semester said, well, could you teach con law for me too, constitutional? I had forgotten every bit of con, so I did that, which was, you know, but um, I think listening to your client, and like I said, not trying to explain things in plain English. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's like going to a doctor and they're just all these medical terms you gotta go home and look up. It's like, I, I never found that to be at all useful. And I think, you know, by, by taking a real interest in people, by being responsive, um, I mean, let's face it, the clients really don't have a way to judge the quality of your work. I've always said, if they liked you, you treated them with respect, empathy for their problems, because that's why they're there to, to see you. Um, I think that's why 80% of my clients ended up being my friends. And having so many clients that have, for 35 years, 30, 35 years, you know, I've represented them. And um, um, so that would be my advice. And, you know, always have a business card handy and tell them what you do, the, the elevator speech. Hi, I'm Mark Barger, you know, I'm a real estate and, and business lawyer, you know, blah, blah, blah. The other thing I used to do some is I tried to um, go give talks. So I, basic will, estate planning, um, you know, I talked to many groups, you know, over the years. And, uh, you know, I found that to be really useful and, and, you know, got, frankly, a lot of business out of that. But, and I think you have to be yourself. I mean, I'm a shy person, you know, I don't relate well to people. Yeah. <laughs> That's clear. Um, what's the question I should be asking you, Mark? Can I have... What are you going to do in the next few years? What are you going to do in the next few years? Well, uh, I semi retired. So um, I represent uh, two credit unions in town and we've been doing their home equity uh, mortgage work for the past few years. It's all remote. And um, as you know, I'm uh, relocating to Florida, but I'm gonna continue to do that. And I do, I give them some other, I do some other uh, work for them, mostly if they have questions about stuff, I'm, you know, on a retainer basis. Um, I have, a bunch of estates to finish up that will not be done when I leave, so I'll be doing that. Um, but the other thing that I really want to do is I want to do some volunteering. Uh, I've been pretty active uh, with uh, men's groups in my church, so I want to do that. Um, I'd love to find something like a community foundation committee or some uh, way of getting involved in the community. Uh, I might uh, rejoin uh, or join uh, a Rotary Club down there. Um, and just to, to try to, again, be in the community. Um, so that's, you know, that's what my plans are after we get settled and, you know, the shock of, <laughs> of moving and trying to figure out, you know, where the DMV is to get your car registered and all that fun stuff. Well, you'll be missed in the bar. You've been a tremendous asset and uh, something I that uh, appreciate you that. left a fond legacy. Wow. I, I appreciate that. I, I don't, you know, those are kind words. Yeah. Kind words. Thank you for taking the time. Because yeah. I know you're trying to wrap up, and here we are. I, I wouldn't have missed doing this for the world. <laughs> There's medicine for that. <laughs>